It has been said that every person has a book within them, the story of their life, the events that shaped them, the passions that moved them, the people that influenced them, the moments that impacted them, even the faith that transformed them. And through these stories flows joy and sorrows, disappointments and delights, countless twists and turns, all interwoven to create a never-before-told, one-of-a-kind story. The story of you. It's a story still being written by you and by God, day after day, line after line, storylines, write good things. Setting. A late night in a hotel lobby in London, 1924. Characters. In order of, of appearance. Ben Harper, the night clerk. Lois Wellston, a rich widow. Roger, her husband. Rather, her soon-to-be husband, soon-to-be her fourth husband, Fritz Babcock, a hotel guest, a policeman. You know, there's more than one way to communicate a story. In fact, most of us, the way that we communicate a story is how we simply tell it, we share it. It's a great example this morning, even having Alan and Sue with us, the fact that the greatest story ever is told the best way, sometimes just verbally and audibly. But we also don't just tell stories, we also write stories. That's the essence of books and the novels that we read and things like that. They are all things that have been written down. But then there is another way that we can share a story too, and that is to act it out. And that's what we see in the movies, and that's what we see in the television. And sometimes that's what we see in the theater, if you want to go see a play. We act out a story, and that really may be the best way for us to tell the story of ourselves, because we are literally acting it out on the stage of life as we go right now. And so the story of you can easily be compared to the story that we'd see on a stage or in a play. If you're going to have a great play, if you're going to have a great story, what does it take? Well, first of all, it takes a good storyline. I mean, we want it to have action. We want it to have intrigue. We want it to have suspense. We want it to have a great plot with twists and turns. And and so we're looking for a great storyline. But even a great storyline is not going to work unless you have good characters. In every play, every manuscript is dependent upon good characters. And if you pick up a manuscript, and if you've ever read through a play, and I used to lead and direct plays in the past, play manuscripts are not the easiest thing to read. But at the beginning of a play manuscript, you open it up and it'll usually give you the setting, and then it'll give you the cast of characters, often in order of appearance. But it's just the people who are going to appear in that play. Sometimes the author includes a few brief remarks about that character to help you as the play director, the person reading, get to have an understanding of who he's like or what he does in the story. The best, the best playwrights don't actually do that because they write characters with so many levels and layers and depth that you get to know them as the story goes on, uh, on stage there. But the truth of the matter is you can't really have a play without characters. Otherwise, you just have a stage full of props. But you can't have a story of your life without characters either. And your story has its own cast of characters. It's the people who have come in and out of your life, some who have come and gone, and some who are still there today. But there are the people, major and minor, good or bad, Heroes, even sometimes villains, some in lead roles, some in supporting roles. But your story, your story, like any story, hinges on the characters of your story. So as we get started this morning, I ask you to do a little exercise here. You can write this down. You can do this in your mind. It's up to you. But who would you say are the four or five or six major characters in your life, the people 
who have had the greatest impact on your life. Because we want to talk about them today and how they have affected your story. Because the story of you has been impacted by those people who are in it. Now we've been talking about this story of you, and as we started at the very beginning, we said the story of you is not a timeline of the events of your life, although it does include the events of your life. But the story of you is all of these components, these elements, that factors that have combined and have become who you are. And we've mentioned several things. Let me just uh, re- review a little bit this morning here. We talked about our crafting. This is who God made us to be. And we talk about the gifts that he gives us and even the leanings that we have and, and our personalities and all of those things that are just shaped by God and given to us at birth. And we develop some of those things, but we're born with these. These are natural aptitudes. That's part of our story. Our past is part of our story. Sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. And a lot of times we talk about our past. We talk about the, the experiences that we've had. It also includes some of the environments that we've had as well. We talked about our nature. And sadly, all of us are born with a sin nature, and that actually impacts and affects our story too. But we also have the Holy Spirit who comes and re- redeems us and, and, and gives us a new nature. That's part of our story, and that leads into our souls. And our, soul, our, our stories are spiritual at the core because we were made in the image of God, not to look like God physically, but to look like God spiritually. We also talked about how our stories are shaped by our thoughts and those things, that conversation, that, that monologue that runs through our mind constantly and how that shapes us and how that affects us. And we talked about how our culture actually affects us too. And we say, well, culture is negative, but the place where you live, where you grew up, all of those things affect us. We are affected by the fact that we live in the Western world, and we see the world through Western eyes. We're affected by the fact that we live in Detroit. That's part of our culture. And a little bit of the Detroit culture is we have a chip on our shoulders, like Detroit versus everybody, right? That's part of our culture, and we have church culture, and we have religious culture, and we have family culture, and we have generational culture. All of those things combine to make you you, and why is that important, though? It's important because it helps you understand some of the things that you experience in your life, and it's important because it helps us as we understand that to know what to do to make changes in our life so that we can come, become not who we want to be, but so we can become who God made us to be and who God wants us to be. When we go through re-engage, we, we do a lot with our stories, and we talk about this, and, and we share these stories. And if you've been through re-engage, I think you probably understand even more what I'm talking about here. It's all of these things that come together, and they form us, And they form even our relationships, but those relationships form us too. And so we want to look at those relationships and how that affects our stories or the characters in our stories. And so we could add that to the list of story elements, our relationships. See, the person you are right now has been dramatically shaped by the people who have been a part of your life, both in positive and negative ways. So let's talk about who those people are. Let's talk about how they have influenced you up to this point. And let's talk about how we can be intentional about the characters in our story, in these relationships that we form. But before we do that, I want to ask you to do something else. I want you to think just for a moment of those people that you listed to start with, those four, five, six people. How have those people impacted you? What did they do, but how has it changed and how has it affected your life? And you could be thinking about that as we go to to our uh, story today in 1 Kings chapter 2. And we're going to start reading at the very first verse there. And as you turn there, as you're thinking about that question there, how people have impacted you. Let me just give you the backstory or the setting, if, if you will, for what's happening here. David is actually dying. He's on his deathbed, and he's calling in his son Solomon. But prior to this, another son by the name of Adonijah, who has looked at his father dying and said, you know what? He's about to pass on. I'm going to nominate myself to become the next king here. 
And so he had put together a little bit of an uprising, and he had declared himself to be the king. Well, the people in the kingdom knew that David was dying. They didn't really know what was going on. And so Adonai just says, I'm going to be the king. And everybody's like, okay, that's fine. And so the, the people start to follow Adonijah. Well, this wasn't David's plan. It wasn't God's plan. And Nathan the prophet, you might remember him from earlier in David's story, he gets wind of this. And so he actually goes to Bathsheba, one of David's wives, and said, hey, did you know that Adonijah has kind of taken the throne here? And Bathsheba's like, no, but my son Solomon's supposed to take the throne. And so the two of them go to visit David, not together, concurrently, uh, or, or uh, actually in, in sequence there. And they tell David what's going on, and David's like, no, 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 that's not the plan. The plan is for Solomon to be the king. And so Solomon has just been made the king when David calls him in here. And what David is basically doing in this story is he's giving him his last words. And so we have these two characters in the story that we can start with. We've got David and we've got Solomon. But as we read this story this morning, we're going to add three more characters as we go, and they're going to be really, really important. So read with me here in chapter uh, 2, verse number 1. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to his Solomon, his son, and he said, I am about to go the way of all earth, he said. And so he gives some advice here. First of all, be strong. Know what you stand for. Have courage of your convictions. Face off and overcome adversity. Strength is always measured against adversity. We don't know how strong we are until we have, see how much weight we can lift, but adversity defines strength. So he says, be strong, act like a man. And I don't think this meant to you know, beat on his chest and walk around with a swagger or get a big pair of boots or get a dog or anything like that. When he talks about being a man, is he like being a person of restraint, of discipline, a person of wisdom, a person who's respectable, a person who treats people well? And so he gives two pretty standard pieces of advice. Be strong, act like a man. Then he goes on in verse number three, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him. Keep his decrees and commands, his laws and his regulations is written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me, which was, if your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. And we could summarize that by just saying his third piece of advice is, hey, take care of the spiritual in your life. Take care of your God relationship in your life. And this is pretty much what we would expect. What we might say to our own kids, be strong, act like a man, uh, make sure that you prioritize God in your stories. But then he takes a turn in his last words here, and it's a little bit, I think, unexpected, and in my opinion, maybe even a little bit weird, but this is what he says. Verse number five, now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zariah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime, as if in battle, and with that blood, he stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. In other words, don't let him die a natural death. He needs to be executed for the crimes he's committed. And so there seems to be some unfinished business with this guy named Joab. And I'm going to ask some people in the audience to help me here this morning, so please humor me here. But I need somebody to come up here and beat Joab, and I'm looking at Joe Coons right there, and that's kind of close to Joab. Would you mind being Joab here for, uh, for me this morning? And we're going to come up here and give you this sign to represent Joab. And as he comes, we're going to keep reading there in verse, thanks, Joab. Thank you. Verse number seven. But he says, but and David speaking, he says, but show kindness to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And so there's some unfinished business with Joab. It's kind of negative. He said, hey, there's some unfinished business with Barzillai, which is actually good. Gary Johnson, would you mind helping me out here? You look like a Barzillai to me. And then we keep reading here in verse number 8. And remember, you have with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Barum, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahanaim. 
When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You know what will not do with him. Bring his great head down to the grave in blood. In other words, don't let him die a natural death. He needs to be taken care of either. So Brian Manganello, you look like a shimmy eye to me. So we're going to give you this guy's name. Now, if you look at these three names here, Joab might be familiar to most of us. How about Barzillai? Anybody real familiar with who Barzillai is? How about Shimei? All right, good. I'm glad you came this morning. We're going to help you out, all right? So here are the stories of these guys. By the way, let me read verse number 10. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. So the very last thing that David says is, um, deal with Shimei. Okay, and then he's gone. So those are his final words. And so we've added these three guys to the, our cast of characters here, Joab, Barzillai, and Shimei. Let's talk about what they have to do with David and why they're a part of his story. If you go back into 2 Samuel 15, 16, somewhere in there, another son, not Adonijah, not Solomon, another son by the name of Absalom, while David was still king and was still somewhat healthy, decided that he wanted to be the king. And he organized a coup, and he actually overthrew David. And David was chased out of the palace, and David was chased across the countryside and, and, and fled in exile just to spare his life. And all three of these guys had something to do with that story. Well, the first guy, Shimei, when David was running, we're going to work with these in reverse order here, and since they're up there this way anyhow, when David was running, Shimei met David and his entourage, and they're escaping uh, Jerusalem in, in the forces of Absalom here. And Shimei comes out, and he curses David, and he throws stones at him, and he mocks him, and, and he basically just rails on him. And the entourage with David's like, hey, you don't have to take that. I know we're running, but you don't have to take that. And David's like, nah, just let him be. Like, who knows what he's saying? But it's like David had bigger things on his mind than worry about a guy named Shimei. Well, eventually, the, the overthrow was thwarted, and David came back to Jerusalem, and guess who met him on the way? Shimei, to say, oh, I am so, so sorry, I shouldn't have done that, I feel really bad about what he said, about the rocks that I threw, and, David, and the people were like, you shouldn't let him off the hook, and David's like, you know what, good things are happening now, we're just going to leave it as it is, and he goes back to, 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 to take the throne there, and so that's the story of Shimei. The part of the story of Barzillai, when David ran and he actually had to go across the Jordan and to, to try to get respite, to, to get away from Absalom, Barzillai met him there. I don't think they were friends or even knew each other, but Barzillai was a guy in his 80s, by the way, and he met David and said, you know what, you've got problems here. And here's what it actually says about um, Barzillai. He said he brought bedding and bowls for David. In other words, he looked at David who was in duress and said, I got to take care of this guy. And he brought bedding, a place for him to stay, and he brought bowls, he brought food for him to eat and those people with him. And Barzillai stepped into David's story at the worst possible moment to give him some, some encouragement. Then we get to Joab. Joab was actually the... the um, Second in command. I mean, he was the head of the military, served under David. And uh, Joab was actually the one who quashed the rebellion here. But when he quashed the rebellion, he killed Absalom, David's son, even though David had said, do not kill him. But Joab took matters into his own hand, and he quashed David's son. And David said, okay, you did the wrong thing here. And so he replaced Joab who turned around with a guy by the name of Amasa. We just read about that. Joab turned around and killed Amasa too. And so we have this kind of weird relationship here. So those are these three guys in the story. But these three guys in David's story show up in each of our stories too. And let me explain. We start here with Shimei. We're going to give you a new name here, Shimei. Shimei, you don't know him as Shimei. You know him as the stone thrower. The guy in your life who likes to throw stones. Do you have any people like this? The guy who likes to be the critic that's out to get you, that seems like he enjoys making your life miserable. He's the nitpicker. He's the one who finds fault and failures. He's the one who tries to make you look bad. Ever experienced that? 
So we have Shimeis in his life. And why does he do that? Well, because he has his own problems. And evidently, by throwing stones, he can feel better about himself. Maybe that can empower him and make him feel better about himself. Or at the very least, it can deflect and distract so people aren't staring at him. But he's the guy who attacks others because he's all about himself. He's the guy who's willing to take advantage of somebody else for his own good. He's the guy who actually says something really nice to you while you're there. And the second that you turn your back, there's a knife in it. Or he's the guy, when things are going bad, disappears unless he shows up to say, well, you should have asked me because I could have told you better. Know anybody like this? We all have shimmy eyes in our lives. These are the people that may be in our families. They may be in our workplaces. They may be in our friendship circles. They actually show up in churches too. But you need to beware because shimmy eyes will do great danger to you. And what was David's advice to Solomon? I didn't deal with him, but you need to. In fact, you need to have him eliminated. That seems extreme, doesn't it? But David's point is this person will do great damage in your life, Solomon, if you let him live there. Well, then we go on to Barzillai. And fortunately, we have the nice guy, and so we're not going to call him the stone thrower. We're just going to call him Mr. Bedding and Bowls. Because he's the guy who shows up in your story when you need somebody desperately. And maybe you've had these experiences too. He's the guy who comes when you're at your lowest. When you're beat up and when you're bloody and when it seems like the whole world is against you. And he's the guy who shows up and says, the whole world's not against you because I'm here with you too. And maybe you've had that moment when somebody walks through a hospital door. Or maybe you've had that moment when somebody shows up with a meal. Or maybe you've gotten that phone call and somebody says, boy, I know you're beat up right now. I just want you to know I'm with you. I'm praying for you. And they bring the bedding and they bring the bowls. And you know what? All of us in our stories, if we're honest, we've had those people too. And don't you wish you had more of them? And I think about those people in my story, Pete and Cheryl and Kevin and Susan and Tom and Joy who came at the lowest point in my life and said, you're not alone. You're not alone. And so this is the story here. And what David's advice is, he's saying, well, it doesn't actually say to take care of Barzillia. He offered to him Barzillia. I said, no, I'm old, I'm good. But what David is saying is, take care of his sons because these are the people that you need in your life. Invest in these kind of relationships. And so we have the bad person, and we have the good person, and then we have Joab over here. And Joab is what I would call the it's complicated person. He's the person in your life that you can't quite decide if he's good or you can't quite decide if he's bad. See, Joab had been David's right-hand man. Joab was the one who actually led the charge to take over Jerusalem originally so that Jerusalem could be established as as the capital. He had been David's trusted ally. He had even given David good advice in the past. And he was the reason behind David's military success. But he's also the one to kill Absalom. He was the one to murder two other guys. He was the one to back, actually, in this story. He backed Adonijah at the end of David's life, and things had gone south. But here's how I would describe Joab. He's armed and dangerous. And that's part of the appeal. And we all know people, and we all have people in our lives who are like this. They kind of live on the edge. They're the ones that will say the things that you think, but you're too afraid to say. And they say them, and you're like, yeah, I wish I'd said that. They're the ones who are willing to take the risk. They're the ones that get a little dirty, that live kind of out there uh, on the edge of things. But they're the guys that also will be your buddies. They'll be there with you. They'll go through battles with you. And I mean, they've got presence. They've got power. They've got personality. And people are actually attracted to them. And you kind of like these people in your story because they have something that you can give. And you get into some of these relationships sometimes where it's like, well, you know what? If you protect me, military guy, I'll protect you. I'm the king. And we get into some of these relationships where there's this reciprocity. It's not healthy, 
but we stay in these relationships because of what we can get out of it. And sure, it's going to cost us a little bit, but we're good with the transaction because of the benefit. Sure, we know this guy's a little bit of a loose cannon. He's got a temper. He's impulsive or he lacks self-control. He can be dangerous when he's cross, but that's okay. I'll just keep him on my side and we'll be okay. But what was David's instruction on this guy? Well, it was the same as it was on this guy. Get rid of him. Get him out of your life. Thanks, guys. So how do we take all of this? And how do we relate it to my story and to your story? Because these guys, the stone thrower, the betting and bulls person, the armed and dangerous, they are all part of your story too. So let me just leave us with four ideas here this morning. The first thing is this. You need to make your relationship with God your first priority. You need to make your relationship with God your first priority. Don't lose that in this story. What's the first advice that God gave to Solomon? Hey, follow God wholeheartedly. And when we talk about the relationships in your story, there's no relationship more important than your relationship with God. And if you've never settled or or established that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that is the most important thing that you can do. Because when you get that relationship in order, other relationships will be easier to keep in order. In fact, we could say it this way. Your relationships with others will not be what they can be if your relationship with God is not what it should be. Your relationships with others will not be what they can be if your relationship with God is not what it should be. Secondly, you need to understand just how much impact the characters in your story have. And we all get this at some level. You know, we've heard this growing up. Be careful who you make your friends because your friends have influence on you. Your friends can actually lead you in bad directions. Your friends can actually get you to do dumb things. And most of us have experienced that, where you've done something really stupid, and why did you do it? Because you were influenced by the crowd that you were in. And so we understand it from that standpoint, but we also need to understand it from this standpoint, is our friends actually affect the way that we view life how we see things, even the attitudes that we, that we carry, our friends affect that, and we start to think like, look like, sound like our friends oftentimes, and so we need to be aware of how they actually impact our stories, both for good and for bad. And this is what's going on here. David's saying, hey, you need to stay away from the shimmy eyes, that's not going to be good for you. You don't need somebody who's continually taking pot shots at you, throwing grenades. In fact, you actually have the power and you have, the, you have just cause to completely eliminate this guy from your story. And why is David saying that? It's because this guy will affect your story. The same thing with Joab, and it's even more obvious with Joab, who's running around with spears and daggers and things like that. But the truth of the matter is that we all have people who walk in and out of the pages of our stories who have tremendous impact. And we need to stop and say, well, what impact do they have? And this could be anybody, and I'll just pick one as an example here. Like, dad, the father in your story, what impact has he had? And some of you maybe grew up in a great home and you had a great relationship with your dad and maybe he was like your biggest cheerleader or he was a friend. But others, maybe dad was absent, either physically or emotionally. Or others, maybe dad was abusive and manipulative and always diminishing you. But whatever that relationship was, it has affected you and your story And you need to be aware of that. So when we talk about roles and stories, we're not just talking about, well, this is my boss, or this is my dad, or this is my partner, or this is whatever. It's not like, this is my maybe stone thrower. This is maybe my encourager, my betting and bullets person. And we need to start realizing what roles people play. I think about this when I talk about my dad. And for for, for me, my dad was a positive. He was a great example. He was... um, 
he, he was a good dad, but you know what? As I got older and started to look at my dad, I started to realize something. My dad grew up in a home where he was, um, well, in fact, he said this. My, my father looked at me one day and said, you'll never amount to anything, will you? And my dad took that with him his entire life. And my dad spent his entire life trying to prove to the world that he was amounting to something. But he needed to understand, and I'm not sure that he ever did, he needed to understand the role that he played in that story. And so I would say to us this morning, as you look at your category of people, who are the people that are the negative, the shimmy eyes that say, you know what, they just don't need to be part of my story? Who are the people who are the Barzilli eyes, like, yeah, I need more of those people in my stories? But what about these Joabs? It's so complicated, isn't it? And I think that's one of the difficult parts of our stories. It's because there's a lot of people in our stories that we just can't get rid of. Your parents are your parents. You just can't get rid of them. Your boss is your boss. I guess you could quit, but you probably can't get rid of your boss. Your neighbors, unless you want to move, are still going to be your neighbor. We have these people in our lives that we can't get rid of. And it complicates us. So what do we do with that? You need a plan to deal with the various types of characters, especially when they fall into the it's complicated category. So let me just suggest three things quickly as we finish up here this morning. The first thing is this. You need to negate the negative. If you can physically avoid a relationship that's really bad and harmful, that's good. But you may not be able to do that and you may not be able to do that because of simple things like grace and kindness, but you can still distance yourself in appropriate ways. You may need to step back emotionally. You may need to step back mentally, or you may need to even prepare for the encounters that you have. You can establish some boundaries, and you can just say, you know what? You're not coming any further here. And they don't have to be physical boundaries, and they don't even have to be spoken boundaries. They can be boundaries over your own heart where you realize that that person can do damage to me, but I can't listen to that person. I need to listen to God, the song we sang earlier. Who are we? And so we negate the negative, and maybe all of it, maybe if you've got a lot of harmful messages or, or abuse or whatever in your past, you need to start pushing back against that with truth in your story to say, no, what is actually the truth here? And to negate the negative. Now, that doesn't mean that we walk around and, and, and we try to be adversarial or, 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 or push people off um, by, by the way that we conduct ourselves. In fact, you might even have to offer forgiveness. Sometimes we say, though, you know, I need to forgive and forget. Well, you need to forgive, and we need to forget as far as letting go of it. But you can still remember. And that's what happens here with David, is David f- forgave in a sense, but it's like, you know what, I still remember. And there may be people in your life that you have to say, you know what, I, I still have to be careful here. An, an apology ends the debt, but it doesn't end the memory, and it doesn't regain trust. And sometimes we just have to be cynical in a healthy way, if that makes sense, to say, okay, I need to be really, really careful. Negate the negative, and if you've got people in your life that are like that, Take steps, not to, not to oppose them, but take steps to offset the impact that they're having in your life. Secondly, you need to pursue the positive. When you find those people in your story that breathe life into your soul, that encourage you, that, that you enjoy being with for positive reasons, that you walk out of the room and you're like, boy, I'm glad I, I, I connected with them today. That when they call on the phone and you see their name come up on the screen, you're like, oh yeah, good, I'll take this call. Wherever you know those people, pursue those relationships. And by the way, you can be that relationship too. But pursue the positives. The betting and bowls person, you need those people in your life. And if you've got them in your life in the past and maybe you've kind of lost track of them, maybe you need to pull them back into your life. And then thirdly, you need to be very cautious with the complicated. There are people in our stories, and we can't just run from everybody that we know, okay? And we can't go through and say, well, you're on this list, you're on this list. The truth of the matter is most of us end up on this list. Some days they're like the, they're, you know, the most encouraging people we've met, and then the next day they've got something negative to say, and you're like, I can't even figure out what their role is. Just be careful. Be cautious. Know what you're doing there. 
And so we have all these characters in our stories. Some are like Shimei. Either in your past or in your present, but they have a very negative impact and very negative effect. Some are like Barzillai, the people who give you life and encourage you. And some are like Joab. But as you write your story, let me just finish with this advice this morning. First of all, don't let Shimei sit at your keyboard. He doesn't belong there. Secondly, Barzillai, give him all the paper you can because you want him writing into your story. And thirdly, Joab, well, if he's typing, it's probably a good idea if you just look over his shoulder to make sure it's okay. But it's your story, and it's yours to write. So let's write good things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come this morning grateful for even some of these obscure stories in Scripture that we, don't, or that we often read right past. But God, as we look at our stories and the stories that you're forming in us and the things that you're doing to make us who you want us to be, we recognize the role of people recognize the role of people, and we ask you to give us wisdom in dealing with them. And our goal is not to be harsh or to, to be unkind or, or to be ungracious, but at the same time, you give us wisdom, and we pray that you give us wisdom to, to, to know who's the good, the bad, or, or the, the complicated. We just pray for that wisdom. And our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The first question here this morning is, do you have a relationship with God? That's the most important thing, that relationship right there. But then secondly, the question is, what are the relationships in your life like? The truth of the matter is, most of us are not very intentional about our relationships. They just kind of happen. But every relationship has the potential to do great good or great harm in our lives. We need discernment. And so the question for you this morning is, what step do you need to take in a relationship? And I don't know which of those relationships you think about, but what step do you need to take? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of people and relationships in our lives. We pray that you would help us to have great relationships so that we can become the person that you want us to be. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got a story, lines, uh, story prompt for you here today. Talk about a Brazilian. This is in your journal. Hopefully you're still following along in your storylines journal. Talk about a Brazilian in your story and how that person has impacted you. This could even be like a note to them. It doesn't have to be sent to them. But if you're just writing, what would I say to that person who has been such a blessing in my life? Or Maybe you need to talk about a Shimei or Joseph in your life, and again, or Joab, Joab, sorry, in your life. This doesn't need to go to them, but maybe you need to think through how that person's affected your relationship so that you can get some healing and so that God can write into your story. So I encourage you with that. And then I want to uh, finish this morning here with an announcement, and I am going to try to read this and make it through. Um, we talk about in the Bible, the Bible tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And this morning, I'm going to invite you to weep with me. Several years back, some of you will remember, we did an event called Kickball for a Cause with Salama School, a school for blind kids in uh, Uganda, basically. Some of them abandoned by parents, some of them parents just can't educate them, and so they send them to this school so they can uh, be educated, and it's a, it's a Christian organization. And I got a text from my uh, daughter on Friday, but uh, last Tuesday there had been a bad fire at Salama School. In that fire, 11 girls were killed. Six are still hospitalized. And so I immediately, I've had some contact with the headmaster of the school, Francis, and sent him a text and I got a, a voice message back from him yesterday to saying, you know what, it's been a great tragedy, but we're going to go on. But I want to invite you to pray for them this morning. Um, incredible loss. And I want to invite you to pray for my family too. The connection to Salama School was my daughter, Lindsay, who studied abroad in Uganda for a semester. 
And as part of her program, she did a practicum at Salama School. But the girls she worked with were the girls that lost their lives. And she started. And so I hate to end on like a low note this morning. But I would just ask that you would remember Francis, the headmaster, these families who've lost kids, kids in this school, and uh, they've just got all kinds of things to deal with. They're waiting to get the remains back of these kids once they've been identified, and they'll do a funeral, and then they'll be sent to their, to their families. But I just would pray for your prayer and ask for your prayer. And I just pray that we would be faithful in praying against the enemy. He's evil. And he does great harm. But we know that God is bigger and that God overcomes. And let's pray that God's grace in this story, and by the way, they think this fire may have been deliberately set. They're not sure. But let's pray that God will somehow do something unexpected and fantastic in this story. So would you pray with me this morning, and then you guys will just sing us out of here if that's okay. God, we don't get it. And we hurt and we grieve right now. We're grateful for the fact that we believe there's 11 little girls with you now. And we know that they can see for the first time. And yet the hurt that we feel is just horrible. I pray that you give us wisdom to know how we can be part of the family, how we can support believers in another part of the world. And I pray that you would just do something incredible in this situation, that out of this evil, incredible goodness would come. We don't know what that looks like. But we ask it from you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me? This morning again, Alan and Sue, I'm so glad that you guys are here. Thanks for sharing. They'll be in the lobby afterwards. You can take a look through her goodie bag, too, to see the, uh, the evolution of gospel recordings. Uh, thanks to all of you here. You know, let's be encouraged, though, in the fact that we have a God who loves us and walks with us and grieves with us in our moments and rejoices with us in our moments as well. You're dismissed. <laughs>